talking about how you felt, if you had any regrets about not being able to make that movie based on the recent um, story with Haley Barber in Mississippi and a similar situation there. Well, yeah, I, 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 would, I want it. I, I, I would love to have made that film. It's actually made me think about it, though, and I've made some stabs in this direction, just not concerned enough to want to explore it as fiction. I mean, fiction based on fact. Um, I think it'd make a great comedy, uh, you know, with teeth. Um, but um, I just, I just thought it, it had so much to offer because it, it had that, you know, the things I'm attracted to are, you know, are things that I perceive to be complicated realities and complicated situations. To me, that's a really intensely complicated situation. In fact, most of the guys that serve are African American, if not all, in the governor's mansion because they found out that when they when they mixed it up with races, that there was too much tension on the staff. So they did. And I remember when I went down there, when I was in the process of trying to get this off the ground, I met with the woman who was this sort of chief of staff, who's not from Angola, um, who was this Southern Belle, very attractive, sort of 35 Southern Belle kind of woman, but steel, steel in her spine to handle that job. And she was lamenting about how hard it is to get new recruits out of Angola that, that, that are satisfactory to them because so many of the murderers in Angola are not crimes of passion, but over drugs and things like that. And she said to me, it's hard, to, this is a direct quote, it's hard to find a good class of killer these days. <laughs> well, that's the title. Yeah. <laughs> okay, we have time for one more question, so it's gonna be from Raymond. Yeah, a good class of killer, yeah. Uh, hi, uh, you spoke of the pervasiveness of media um, in this day and age affecting the openness of public figures to uh, filmmakers. Um, I was just wondering if you could bring uh, some of your views or experience with legislation and laws against filmmaking. Um, you see a lot of uh, protests these days um, being uh, corralled by uh, lawmakers and um, I was just wondering, like laws like the Illinois eavesdropping laws, which is can bring felony charges to those who are taking footage of police officers doing their public duty. Um, I was just wondering if you could, you know, give us a, an idea of how you see the future of documenting public discourse and protest in that sense. Well, to be honest, I'm I'm woefully ignorant of of some of these laws that you're talking about. Um, uh, so I'm probably not in a in a good position to uh, to give give a view because I'm I'm ignorant of it. I can say that um, you know it, it, I think that it's it's always been a struggle for documentary filmmakers with people in positions of power. But I just I, I just think as I said earlier that the more savvy people become, the more people try to um, control that, and a lot of times. When people try to control their image, if they let you film or if you're allowed to film in any way, shape, or form, they still reveal themselves. I mean, I've seen that time again. People that often think they're controlling the message really aren't controlling the message. I think there is something about the camera <laughs> that they can kind of dig beneath uh, that and, and get at a truth. I, I think that one of the biggest threats to documentary filmmakers in recent years has been um, the fact that films are uh, documentaries are perceived as commercial entertainment now and not journalism necessarily and with that has come way more exposure for films they play in theaters much more frequently you know than they ever did before uh, but what it caused is the gatekeepers the distributors and the television stations where that, that control your film getting out demanding making certain demands on the filmmaker like having releases on everybody that appears in the movie or uh, in any substantial way, or having to license every bit of media that you might take and want to declare fair use on. And one of the, you know, one of the great things about what's happening in recent years on the part of independent filmmakers is they push back on the fair use question. Because it wasn't maybe 10 years ago, it was almost impossible to put anything fair use in a film and have it distributed in a theater. They, the, the distributors were just insistent that it had to be licensed, and, and that just that's a serious undermining of journalism, uh, 
journalism's ability to to comment on the world we live in because you you know if you're making a film that's stridently anti Coca-Cola uh, and you're you want to use their ads or something as part of your uh, argument you, you do you think Coca-Cola is going to license it to you no of course not so um, I think filmmakers have proven over the years to be pretty resilient and um, and you know my experience with cops which is really interesting my experience with cops came on the interrupters I found that every time you point a camera at a cop, it makes them leave, uh, for the most part. Not every time, but they really don't like cameras pointed at them, but they're also very aware that um, you have a camera pointed at them, and it does sort of put them in an awkward position and, and make them act differently. <laughs> but I haven't had that experience where someone, a cop's come up and you know, grab my camera, take it a camera, or anything like that. So maybe I've just been living a fool's paradise there. All right, uh, thank you guys very much. Uh, we will be in the back talking to you and signing books and DVDs and whatever, whatever else. Uh, but thanks again to the Music Box for having us, and we hope you stick around for the interrupters. What is that? Five. Five o'clock.